edition of Leak Project. I'm your host, Rex Bear, and we have Marshall Masters with us from YOWUSA.com. Now, today is going to be a sneak peek. You're going to see it here first, folks. Cutting edge information. Two suns in the sky. Who lives? Who dies? This three-part series was created especially for those in awareness, many of whom are baby boomers who've experienced dreams, visions, premonitions about the coming Planet X tribulation and the Nibiru pole shift, most since they were children and now as grandparents, they find themselves wrestling with the dilemma of denial, procrastination, and deadly locations. Those in awareness understand that they are no sugar daddies. There's no sugar daddies offering easy and magical solutions to their of hope for those with the ambition to march beyond the stalemate of denial it is one they can use to lay groundwork of safety for themselves and their loved ones for the coming decade-long planet x tribulation this is directly from yowusa.com marshall masters thank you for joining us here at the leak project how the heck are you okay the uh are, is your audio okay on that end yes it is Okay, good. Because I was hearing a little distortion on this end. I didn't know if it was the streaming that I'm doing, but yeah, it could be, and it could be the internet gremlins too. So, okay. Well, Rex, it's good to be back on with you. It's been a while. Of course, I have been really busy working on this project, and uh, this is Two Suns in the Sky: Who Lives, Who Dies. This is a three-part audio book, and what you're seeing right now, it will be the YouTube version that's going to be going live uh, this weekend, and uh, so this is a sneak peek, and what I've done is underneath is all of my audio narration. I'm reading it myself, and what I'm doing is using stock footage from a couple of different companies that I have subscriptions to. And uh, there's three videos and about 250 of these segments, and they're thematically separated. And I just wanted to create a meditative visual because this series is really addressing the end of life as we know it. And it's a very serious conversation about what people can do to survive. I'm talking principally about the people who are in awareness, who have big hearts, but small wallets. And they're going, my God, what can I do? I can't afford bullets, beans, and bunkers. I got a wife or a husband who keeps threatening me with divorce if I don't stop thinking about this. And so there they are, financially restricted, most cases dealing with a spoiler spouse, oftentimes threatening divorce over this. You know, that doesn't happen if somebody likes bowling or roses or knitting clubs or things like that. No one threatens you a divorce if you like to bowl. But if you enjoy uh, or just spend your time, not necessarily enjoying it, but following Planet X, you know, people get all upset because this is a topic that really hits a very deep racial memory in our species. We have these Ingrams of things falling out of the sky, things happening in the sky, and lots of people dying very badly and life becoming brutal and hard. And so that's the reason why uh, denial is so easily provoked. And I explain this in, uh, in this uh, Who Lives and Who Dies because, you know, the Georgia Guidestones over in Georgia, tell us to keep the population of the earth under half a billion in perpetual harmony with nature. Well, they don't tell us how we get to that number, all right? And when you're talking about projections of 90% of humanity perishing during this coming tribulation, now the question is, is how is it 90% actually die. What do they die from? All right. And for the folks in awareness, this is a really 
really difficult question because most of them are baby boomers. All right, I'd say about 70% of the folks that are in awareness on the topic of Planet X are, you know, probably right now between 45 to 75 years of age. That's pretty much the bulk of it. And in many cases, these people have been in awareness about this since they were children. They have been ostracized, isolated, and punished. You know, it's when you go to talk to people about it, the reaction is very much like uh, you're the only one-eyed person in a land of the blind, and all the blind people are screaming at you in a furious rage, hey, stupid, get a sharp stick and poke out your one good eye so you can be smart and clever like us. And as illogical as that may seem, that's exactly what the case is. So I consequently have a lot of grandparents who have contacted me over the years, and they are just absolutely besides themselves because their children love them. They were good parents. They absolutely adore and worship their grandchildren. But the problem is, is when they go to raise the topic and just say, you know, you're not living in a good place. And typically, these grandparents have children and grandchildren in ground zero locations along coastlines, like in big cities such as Los Angeles, New York, and so forth. And their children there, which is consistent with coastal areas where the greatest death and dying will happen, uh, there is the greatest amount of resistance to this knowledge. And their children are just saying, Mom, Dad, shut up. I don't want to hear about it. Don't want to hear about it. And don't talk to my children about it. You're just being old, stupid fool. And, you know, for the grandparents, this is really uh, a very painful thing. Very, very painful thing. And what it really comes down to is it gives them two options. Either they just move forward to do what they can, or they have to make peace with the death wish and uh, decide that they are going to die with their children and grandchildren, that their bloodline is going to stop as though it never existed. And this is especially awful, awful kind of hell for these grandparents. Because a death wish like that is a total death wish. It's not a death wish where you say, I just want to die. No, it's a death wish where you say, I'm going to die watching everyone I love and invested my life into dying along with me. So that all I can do is perhaps give them some modicum of comfort when the end happens. And I've really grappled with that over the years. This is one thing I hear again and again and again and again and again. Um, so a big part of this series when I developed it was for those in awareness, typically the grandparents who have children who are in denial but also for folks in awareness that have a spouse in denial or they have uh, just a limit of funding. You know, this is not a problem for people who can afford to build a million dollar underground bunker because when their family says, you know, maybe they have a son or a daughter comes up and says, dad, you know, you're, you're not the, brightest bulb on the tree here. This is pretty stupid. And all dad has to do is say, well, uh, did you really want to go to Harvard this year and have a BMW? Or would you rather go to a public school and drive an old Chevy Vega? Because you keep annoying I think me. I that the lens jumped in because we have no connection now whatsoever. Pardon? We've lost everything.
Hello. Mr. Masters. Hello. Hey, lost you. Are you there? Yeah, the internet gremlins got us. Oh. Yeah, they like to they like to jump out during my live shows and eat some bandwidth. They get hungry, especially when it gets good. Okay, so uh, where Let's are we at? Continue. Let's just continue. Huh? Let's just continue okay. where you left off. All right. The audience is in suspense. So that's the whole point of this series, and I have been working on this for three months now. And it's a major work, and this is the most uh, aggressive project I've ever done because I actually started out writing a script, and then I just decided that I was going to turn it into an audio book. So this is a multi-platform project. I'm bringing it out, a printed transcript of the book, which will be available on my site and at Amazon.com when I release that. Uh, there's going to be the YouTube videos, which are going to be 1080 HD. And uh, also I'm going to have copyable DVDs available at my website and also audio CDs plus an ebook. So this is something where I have created it in, you know, all these different formats, YouTube, HD, you know, then DVD, audio CD, print book, ebook, five different formats. So folks, you know, can get the message. And this is about a very sober way to go about thinking about this. And I have a lot of specific takeaways. That was a very big part of my strategy with this was not only to answer the big questions as to well, why are so many people going to die? What is the mechanism that's going to create 90% of the population on the face of the earth to go the way of the dinosaurs and the dodo birds? I answer that. And I answer it in a way that makes sense. But also, I have takeaways. Oh, if you're in awareness, what can you do, all right, to overcome your financial limitations and to get away from this you know, I don't have bullets and beans and bunkers or the wherewithal to buy them and that's really not what's going to be important uh, you know what I deal with in this series is explaining what will be the three major causes of death and those three major causes are going to be denial procrastination and location now, folks in awareness can obviously get past the big killer, which will be denial. But procrastination is a real trap from them. You know, or, or previously I was talking about grandparents having to deal with this, you know, death wish of dying with their families. Or you have folks that are just, you know, they can't do anything. Uh, they're really shut down. They're very isolated, uh, ridiculed, and mocked. And so they just spend a lot of time on social media sites and on the web. And they're just looking for information, looking for information, looking for information. And that's a placebo effect. That's all it is. Uh, you're not going to be any more capable of surviving what's going to come if all you're doing is becoming informed. At some point, you have to go from being informed to taking action. And in this series, what I do is I'm giving people who do not have financial wherewithal a very solid plan for what they can do to not only save themselves, but to provide an opportunity for their loved ones in denial so that they can save their lives as well, that they're creating an opportunity of safety for them. 
And it's not necessary that their loved ones know about that. It's probably better they do not. But this is something they can do. And who needs to look at people when it's happening and just say, well, I told you so. Oh, that's a Pyrrhic victory. That's just pure ego talking. And a matter of fact, what I tell people is, you know, saying that probably could get you killed because when things really start to pop, Rex, uh, people are going to be in a compression in my video, the five stages of catastrophism. You know, I talk about the five stages, that being, I don't have time for this crap, stage one. Stage two is, ooh, crap. This is when all of a sudden, one day, you just are <laughs> looking at something and say, well, what am I really looking at? And at that point, you're on the slippery slope of awareness, and there's no going back. Then there's the third stage, which is where people really do themselves the greatest discomfort and uh, disservice. And this is what I call share the crap. Because they keep forgetting everybody that they're trying to share the crap with are still back in stage one. I don't have time for this crap. Then there's <laughs> stage four, which is crap happens. That's resignation. All right. You just, you accept the fact that you are going to be isolated, humiliated, mocked, and threatened because of your awareness. And um, you could very well wind up in many cases, your marriage fails because of it. I had a marriage of 19 years. And this is what exactly, you know, you get through all the other issues and all the yada, yada. And we basically got down to, um, I had a choice. I could continue doing my work on Planet X or abandon that and I could have my marriage back. I wasn't going to do that because I knew I couldn't do it. And those in awareness who gone the same path. Um, yeah. They're the ones that get threatened by the spoiler spouses time and again. It's, it's really awful to have your wife or your husband on nearly a daily basis going, stop this or I'm going to divorce you. Stop this or I'm going to divorce you. It's not like you're <laughs> doing, you know, hard drugs or something like that or gambling the money away for the family. You're, you know, you're still a normal person. Uh, still pulling your weight, but your spouse is just so terrified by what you're talking about. It's, I'm going to divorce you. 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 And you hear that every day. And then finally, one day comes, oh, to hell with it. Divorce me. All right. I'm tired of being threatened. You just get tired of the threats. And so inevitably, it's not the one who threatens the nuclear option. It's the one who gets threatened that eventually says, let's just do it. And then the marriage fails. And I see this quite often. So, you know, I've felt that pain. I have been there. And this is one of the things that I'm really trying to address in explaining why people come to this crisis of denial and what can be done about it. And so that, Folks who are in awareness will not get into the trap of procrastination, which is the second largest cause of death during the coming tribulation. Then the third will be obviously location. If you are living in Los Angeles, that is a ground zero location. And you're just not going to do well there. You know, Think about all the disaster films Hollywood does. Where do they always set the location? Los Angeles. You know, it's like a self-fulfilling destiny. And the coastal areas are the ones that are going to get hammered. So I'm just Let really me jump in on that real quick, can I, Marshall, on the coast? Because I think that's important. You brought up uh, earlier how... There's, you know, a lot of people that have, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. I can hear you. Yeah. Now. Okay. So I have family on the coast mm -hmm. and they've literally got a beach house right off of the Washington coast. And there is no way they're going to leave there. Even if they know 
that a tidal wave would wipe out the area. I mean, if they knew beforehand, I'm sure they would take a drive to avoid it. Yet, if you told them you're probably going to suffer serious catastrophes because a tidal wave <laughs> could hit that location, they're going to say, well, you know, if it happens, it happens. And there's, like you said, millions, hundreds of millions of people that live on the coast. And even if Planet X doesn't cause the next firecracker event that would be a domino effect, in essence, I see so many other things that could happen that being on the coast or in a big city is scary. I mean, for example, when I came back from South Dakota, I stopped in Dallas for on the outskirts of Dallas just to get some gas. And the place was a madhouse. I mean, I'm thinking to myself, what happens if people can't get fuel? What happens if people can't take money out of their ATM? What happens if people can't use their credit card or their debit card? What happens if somebody can't go to the grocery store or get water out of their faucet? It's going to be a nightmare. So people should have an option to prepare. You know, they should do something maybe because like, well, I just want to die if it happens. I just want to go out well quickly. You think you're going to go out quick? You'll be lucky if that happens. I mean, there's going to be people that are going to be like, man, I just wish I went out quick, but I'm going to have to go through hell and back now just to hopefully die. I mean, that's how bad it could get. Now, let's hope that doesn't happen. I certainly hope that doesn't happen. But I'm telling you with the I, I just did a reverse speech analysis yesterday with David Oates. And he was playing back some military stuff from what some generals and people up in the Department of Defense were saying. And if you do reverse speech analysis, it can be frightening how accurate that can be. I mean, he's even been able to break cases before, like with, <laughs> with law enforcement based on reverse speech analysis. So to make a long story short, in this reverse speech analysis, they were talking about nuclear weapons being used in North Korea. And that could be the spark of something nasty. I mean, didn't even Ed Dames talk about that kind of stuff also, saying that North Korea, the Korean Peninsula, was going to be the spark of a forest fire of unprecedented proportions? Well, that's the harbinger event. And according to him, before we see Planet X, now he, uh, in August of last year, had a big you know, swan song seminar and it was about Planet X. And he finally talked about it because it's the one topic that he has sidestepped very carefully. But being that this was his swan song, he finally could talk to it. And I think that has more to deal with the fact that he's actively engaged with intelligence agencies and is under a, probably a whole slew of non-disclosures. So he's, you know, I think, saw an opportunity that he could do that and that the repercussions wouldn't be there because he's walking away. And, you know, it's one of those things that's diminished, but he said that in November of 2017, we would see it in the sky and it would be the size of the moon. And there's also a couple of dates that are coming up now, we also know about September with the Revelations prophecy that uh, those who uh, follow Bible on this are very, very much in tune on. But of equal interest to me, or more interest really, is the coming eclipse on August 21. And you don't know what you're going to see. An eclipse, in terms of bodies in space uh, around the sun during the eclipse. Uh, it's like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get next. However, uh, with August 21, what I'm really thinking about was what started me down this path originally in 1999. It takes me all the way back to my roots. You know, the old saying, what goes around comes around. And August 21st, for me, is a trip back in time to 1999 and the Nostradamus prophecy of the King of Terror, which Nostradamus predicted that this comet would be visible during the eclipse. And the, you know, the thing about August 21, which is really phenomenal for the United States, is that Literally, the umbral path is going to cut right through the center of the country from Oregon to the in the northwest 
uh, going down into the southeast. And so people are going to be able to see the full eclipse right through the heartland of the country. And what happens if all of a sudden thousands of people who are going to be watching the eclipse all of a sudden see something off to the side of the sun, something they weren't expecting to see? That could turn into a watershed event. That is something that would probably kick up the conversation several notches. And then that would be a precursor, if you will, to the September alignment, and uh, which is based on the revelation. And so there is where probably there would even be greater traction. The point of it is that we could very well have a situation where there's a lot of social media focus on this. When I say a lot, I'm talking about many times that of what we're seeing now, uh, beginning in late August. And what we're seeing now, Rex, is amazing. I mean, I can remember uh, my first article on Planet X was January of 2002. So, and I've been doing this full time ever since. And there were years where it was just out in the wilderness. You know, it was just a few of us voices out there. We were the tent poles of the topic, as I've been called. And, but now, <laughs> My gosh, uh, on YouTube, there's just so much Planet X coverage, people reporting observations. Now, you know, there's a mixed bag. There's folks that are, I call them carpet baggers. They're just out for the AdSense revenue. And usually they have these lurid headlines, you know, best ever Planet X observation in the history of humanity and we've never seen before. Stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> You know, they're going out and rehashing other people's There's stuff. There's 14 moons around it, Marshall. I can see them. 14. Look. Oh, yeah, 14 moons, you know, and a lot of this dances with cloud stuff. You know, it's like, I can see light behind that cloud. That's got to be it. It's like, you know, no, <laughs> dances with clouds. I don't. Uh, yeah. Dances with clouds. I'm going to remember that one. Not yeah, dances, dances with, with wolves. Clouds. No, clouds. It's are, dances with clouds. Uh, when you see clouds that are in front the, of passing cloud people. Of an object, that that is a you know smoking gun confirmation that you are not looking at a lens flare. Um, you know the two th knockoffs on this are people who go it's a lens flare or it's a sun dog, and sun dog is a term that was coined up it was really ginned up back in about 2005 2006 uh as uh, nlp neurolinguistic programming and uh, all somebody had to do was say sun dog and that was it everybody went oh then it's nonsense it's nonsense it's a sun dog well you don't know what a sun dog looks like unless you are living in some place like northern minnesota in the dead of winter because these are the kind of weather conditions you need to see in a real sun dog is you're going to have the sun in the center and there's going to be a ring around it, a halo ring. And then there's going to be on the three o'clock and at the nine o'clock relative to the sun, you'll see bright, what appears to look like bright objects, but this is part of the sun dog visual effect. Now, it is interesting in that with climate change, we're seeing sun dogs appearing. And I think also this has something to do with chemtrailing. But we're seeing sun dogs in conditions that are other than what normally one would have expected. But still the same, it's 99% of the time when people say it's a sun dog, they're just, they don't know what they're talking about because they live in an area where they don't see sun dogs. And so it's just a cool term that was invented by disinformationalists and they parrot it 
you know, you know, Polly want a cracker, Polly want a sun dog, Polly want a sun dog. <laughs> okay. They just do it stupidly. And it's kind of a sad thing, but back, you know, 10 years ago when this term first got out there in the lexicon, the people that really put the kibosh on it were the people that were living up in places like Michigan and Minnesota where they actually see real sun dogs. And they were the ones that were going into social media sites and going, you don't know what you're talking about. This is what a sun dog is. And they would explain it to people and they did it enough that finally there was some awareness, but everything passes in time. People have short-sighted memories. And so the term has come back. With lens flares, you know, if you see something passing in front of the object, then you're not looking at a lens flare. And lens flares are things that typically happen right in front of the camera lens or somewhere in the lens barrel itself. So this is a proximity event, a lens flare. And we see all of this nonsense, but uh, these dances with clouds videos where they're going, look, there's definitely something in that cloud. You know, it's like a cloud is a cloud. <laughs> and uh, the only time clouds are useful is when they move in front of an object that is clearly visible to prove that you're looking at a, a, you know, an authentic object. You're looking at something that's really in the sky. Well, that's the thing. I got to jump in on that real quick, too, because I did a video a while back with a gentleman that had some of the best footage of what I thought could be a binary star or a brown dwarf star. Right. And we were able to actually debunk that later because a gentleman that has a channel by the name of Right Side Up was able to show how that it was actually a, a lens reflection off of the layering and how that could actually show on the water itself, even on the ocean. <laughs> it looked like it was real because you could see this reflection of it but what that was was actually lens flare that was bouncing off in multiple layers from all the different lenses in the camera itself plus there was in conjunction of that uh, he used a sun filter and when you use a, an additional layer over the lens something that looks totally legit and you know 95 percent of the people could say wow man that, that absolutely i see that because you can even see the reflection on the water well, there's ways that you can debunk those also if it's if it's not legit. So that's why, you know, the other day I was doing a kind of tongue in cheek, poking a little bit of fun at myself about how some people will spend countless hours looking at lens flares, thinking that that's going to be, you know, that's the end of the world right there. That lens flare is an enormous planet that nobody else can see with telescopes, but they can see it with that one picture. And it's the chemtrails that cause that to be holographic basically that you can see through but everything else is is legit you know that is totally solid so i was i was trying to make my uh, help people understand that instead of looking out for these lens flares which kind of takes away the cause of everything and then it makes people they're really wanting to get to the truth look a little bit off when in reality they're doing a lot more to get to the truth than people that are mocking them you know we really got to be in this together so that's why instead of seeing all these the best thing we can do if because I get countless images a day of what people think is Planet X or Brown Door Star, I'm sure you do too. You probably get hundreds or thousands, probably a lot more than me, because this is something that you've been doing research into for a lot longer than I have. So if, if we can kind of take, yeah. you know, I yeah. always ask people, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on these because I always I answer them and I just say what did you personally observe with your own two eyes? And 99% of them don't answer. Um, Cause they, you know, they, they took a picture and then later on, Oh, well look at that. And what I try to explain to them with smartphones is that still images are very problematic. You can have false positives. Um, so I don't use still phone images. I'd much rather have video and I'd much rather have a video uh, that is, you know, somebody who's sitting there and they're saying, I'm seeing this and I am using my smartphone to document 
what I am seeing. Now, when I get something like that, then I do take it seriously. On steel images, if it's a good high quality camera, digital or print, I'll take that seriously. And I have reported on those. But, uh, and then a lot of people will take and shoot through a window. And I mean, it's ridiculous. They're going, look, look, there's Nibiru. And I'm seeing water spots all over a windshield. And it's right, like, right. The water right. spot Nibiru doom. Yeah. Yeah. The water spot Nibiru do. So are there legitimate sightings? Absolutely. On the cover of the book, I put sightings that I have already produced videos on to show that these are legitimate and you can have circumstances that might look uh, like you're going to have a lens flare and using the reflections on the water is something where if you have a reflection that's just cutting across, but if that reflection is actually following the shape of the waves, that's a different thing. Um, another thing is I test for gamma. And this is something that I've always been doing through the years, is testing for gamma. That is how I discovered the King of Terror comet prophesized by Nostradamus in 1999. That's what started it for me. And at the time, I was the first guy in the neighborhood that had DSL. And so I'm out cruising around and I'm looking for websites that had a lot of graphics because they were going to be the, the slowest running sites and usually not well designed. And, uh, you know, Nostradamus was right up at the top of the pack. And there was a lot of talk about this King of Terror that comet that Nostradamus predicted that we would be seeing it in 1999. And uh, I actually was able to get an MOV file from NASA from Turkey. This is where they had the full path on that. And the MOV file was excellent. The camera was superb. Uh, when I was a CNN field producer, I was very familiar with working with shooters and videographers have an overscan region in a professional camera that says, you know, here's what's happening just outside the frame that you're actually recording. And they have a tendency, if they see something in the overscan, they'll move the camera, all right, pan to it, tilt, whatever they have to do, but they'll reorient momentarily to capture that so that they can study it mostly because they want to see if this is going to move into their field of view and disturb the shot well this videographer this professional who is taking this feed for nasa saw something in the overscan and zoomed up to take a look at it and then determined that it was not going to Cross the field of view, so came back and recentered to his original frame. Well, I saw that and I went, hmm, yippity, 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 yippity. What do we got here? There was my awareness question. See, that's the one that's the slippery slope question. What exactly am I looking at? When you do that, it's, I call it salmon slapping. Because next thing you know, you feel like somebody just slapped you upside the head with a dead salmon, and there you are, spitting scales, wondering when, what just happened. Well, I did an intensive analysis of it, and I published my image analysis on the Millennium Group website. And I used, uh, it was the very first time, I used gamma analysis that I use today for Planet X. So this is something I've been doing since 1999. And I was able to show three objects were imaged near the sun during the eclipse. Uh, and people say, well, you know, why aren't astronomers seeing it pointing their skies at the sun? How many astronomers want to point at their cameras at the sun and burn out the retinas in their eyes? Okay. I mean, it's kind of, a, it's like saying, well, 
prove to me that hitting a bridge embankment will destroy your car. <laughs> Go do it. You know? uh, it's a nonsense thing. Even in 19, uh, what was it? No, in 2013, during uh, the Chelyabinsk event, and the media was going, how come you didn't see it coming? How come you didn't see it coming? And finally, NASA had to admit, we didn't see it coming because we don't look that way. We don't look at the sun. So if NASA is not looking at the sun and they're blindsided by the Chelyabinsk meteor, which detonated over Russia with the equivalent energy of 30 Hiroshima atomic bombs, I mean, that's just, it's this stupid, assuming conventional logic that people are turning their telescopes onto the sun. Aside from the fact you don't during, do it during midday anyway, it's always around sunrise or sunset. You have to have the right lighting conditions. But, you know, going back to King of Terror, I imaged this, and this is what launched my career. This was in 1999, and my article got over 5 million hits, Rex. 5 million. That put me on the map. And one of the first guys to attack me uh, was Richard Hoagland, you know, the Cydonia face guy. Really? Yeah. He came out and he attacked me and he said that I was confused by flash bulbs. That was his exact statement. I was confused by flash bulbs. And I'm going, Richard, I know you're old, but you know, we've gone past Kodak Instamatics and we have these little electronic flashes now, you know? <laughs> We don't use bulbs anymore. Well, that's too uh, bad because, you know, I mean, he, he obviously has done some really good work, in my opinion, on Iapetus and, and certain anomalies on Mars and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's too bad when you kind of get into those word battles and stuff. You know, like you told me one time, it's more like a food fight when you get into that situation where it doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, it just messes up the cause for, for truth, in my opinion. Well, it was an interesting thing because I was, uh, I had a tremendous audience. A lot of people, 70% of my audience was in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. Excuse me. And so the word got out that Hoagland was taking me apart. And next thing I know, I had an image sent to me by a French cosmonaut from the Mir space station that he took a picture all right, during the eclipse, his picture clearly identified two of the three objects, one being a telecommunications satellite in low Earth orbit and the other a spent booster from a Russian launch. The third object was Nostradamus' King of Terror comet, which only would have been invisible during the eclipse and I did gamma analysis on that, but what was clearly obvious was you could see the coma on the front, looks like a horseshoe shape on the front of the comma, comet and on the tail. So, you know, he was, you know, probably shooting me down. Someone asked him to shoot me down or he didn't like the idea of a, a newbie coming out of nowhere finding this. So you, but, you don't uh, think he was being genuine? I mean, in his approach, you think it was more of a because it's one thing if someone's really genuine and they're you know and they're being respectful about it and they're saying, okay, well, this is my position. But was it more like an attack? It was I mean, an attack. You think it was I mean, I I wrote an article titled "Is Richard Hoagland Grabbing at Straws," and that shut him down. He's never said a word about me ever since. Now, what I was told at the time was that. Hoagland was doing a quid pro quo. Somebody wanted me to get shot down and he was given something tasty to do it. And so it was, uh, he attacked me, but it was to get something else. And that's the way it was explained to me by a former intelligence agent. And um, I will say that Hoagland later, his Mission Enterprise site, started doing Planet X research. They started publishing, Hoagland started doing it. And at this time, these were the early days of yowza.com. 
And my uh, other writers on the site were going, wow, we want to cite him. We want to, you know, use his work and incorporate it into ours and give him credit for it. And I said, you're not going to use anything Hoagland writes about. And they were angry with me. Why? I said, because one day Hoagland's going to know, he's going to get an offer he can't refuse. And it's all going to disappear off his website, like methane in the breeze. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> That's it. It's just going to disappear. Nobody believed me. And then sure enough, it disappeared just like methane in the breeze, as I knew it would. And uh, that being said, Hoagland's original work on Planet X was brilliant. I will give him that. He did superb analysis, really superb analysis. But again, you know, he's a political beast. So uh, he got a deal he couldn't refuse and he pulled out. He's not the only one. I've seen others over the years, the one trick ponies, they come and go. And uh, because this is a kind of a, well, in this genre, if you're going to stick it out and you're going to slug through it, you got to decide, are you ready to sacrifice? You're going to sacrifice income. You're going to sacrifice relationships. Um, you know, when I first started Your Own World Books, my publishing business, I was doing third-party technical documentation on computer software. <laughs> it, was, it was like wonderful. I was paying like a stuck slot machine. And you know, there are a lot of times when I really wish I could go back to that old formula writing that was so wonderfully lucrative. But, you know, you, you make a choice. You say, okay, I'm going to do this. And that's it. It's the life you choose. And so I took a substantial loss in income. You know, it cost me a marriage of 19 years, but I can't back down from it. And I'll tell you, Rex, the big reason why I can't back down from it is not the science, which is very compelling. I can't back down because I see how much suppression there is in this by very wealthy and powerful people who do not want this message to come out. You know, my book, Planet X uh, Forecast, was a huge seller, and uh, we brought that book out in uh, 2017, and it was licensed in other countries, uh, Germany, Italy, Japan, all right, and we had other language editions, Dutch and English, sold very well, and I was... Um, now, yeah, very pleased, especially with the Italian edition, the licensee, Academia Press, took the book, translated it into Italian, and it was uh, in 2009, there was the very first Planet X conference in the world, and it was held in Rome, and it was a sellout event. The fire marshal stopped the ticket sales. And because uh, the room was just standing, you know, people were standing three levels deep at the back of the room. Well, Jaco van der Warp, who's a Dutch physicist working with our site at the time, attended and gave a presentation. And uh, after that, uh, we had a huge amount of interest in Italy, in the Italian translation, Academia Press was selling, and it was flying off the shelves. Uh, matter of fact, all of the books on Planet X were flying off the shelves. But then all of a sudden, 2010, I get a cryptic email from my publisher in Italy, and he says, we had to take the book off the market. I'm going, this is crazy, because you're getting, you already sold out your first print run and you're just now starting your second print run, way ahead of schedule, huge runs. And so I called and talked with him, and he finally just admitted, you know, and I'm saying, what really happened here, Rex? And he said, well, what really happened was that the Vatican called the distributors, ordered all of the distributors to take all of the books on Planet X off the shelf, out of the bookstores, to have it returned to them. And usually when 
bookstores return unsold copies to the publishers, those books can, the publisher can take possession of them so that they can resell them. Now, the order of the Vatican was that the books were to be returned to distributors and the distributors were to burn them. And so all of the books that were translated from our title in Italy were taken off the shelf, sent to the distributors and tossed into incinerators. And what was interesting was the Vatican also ordered the distributors to tell their publishers, their clients, that they had been ordered to do that by the Vatican. And when I asked him, I said, are you going to fight this in the courts? He said, are you crazy? It's the Vatican. You don't do that. So this is the kind of suppression that I see. People disappear. Uh, information is suppressed, good information. We see a lot of disinformation, a lot of misinformation out there. You know, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up, Rex. That's what really keeps my feet to the fire, is I'm seeing how much massive effort there is to suppress the topic. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's... When, Marshall, when you had the Vatican, when you heard that the Vatican was the culprit and you were going to have to go, essentially sue them or, or go to court, go to bat with them legally, did that make your heart just drop or what? Well, I was really sad for my licensee. I mean, we lost a lot of money on that. Okay. Um, there's, you know, there, there's, um, and I'm going to put into the message here, there's a, a link to that article from 1999 on King of Terror. But um, I felt really bad for Academia Press because uh, he had paid the licensing and had gone to the expense of printing all these books. Uh, he lost many, many thousands of dollars. It's hard for me just on this alone. And uh, which was brutal because yeah, it, when you're a publisher, to all of a sudden you have something successful that's really doing it. It's like going to the track and, you know, you finally get the right trifecta. Um, the, he was just absolutely tickled pink. And then all of a sudden, boom, he goes from making thousands of dollars to losing thousands of dollars by order of the Vatican nothing to be done for it. And there were different things that have been done to me ever since then. There's always a continual battle of suppression. And I just fight it. I just soldier on. And I just really have come to believe that you know, I took on this responsibility before I was ever born. This was a decision I made before I incarnated. And I just can't back off of it. Now, with everything that's going on right now, geopolitically, and even with the Earth changes, I know you've been keeping track of the comets and the asteroids and the increase and in the influx. Have you done any calculations and predictions where you feel the next 12 months, the next 24 months is going to be? And how much? Well, first, let me just say this. I want to add to that. Uh, I, when I was in South Dakota, I actually was interviewed by a documentary team out there that is doing some serious research into the, um, into the 923 and yeah. the amount of data that these people had, you could tell they were really passionate about it. And they were, you know, they, the, the crew looked like they were all in their thirties and they were very smart. They were nice people literally traveled the world getting information from Sumerian stuff all the way to Hebrew, Egyptian. And the, the guy running the crew really thinks something big is going to happen. 923. I mean, he absolutely believes in it. And I find it fascinating because I can't say exactly where they, you know, who they're connected with yet. What I can say is they are with channels that are on 
various um, you know, cable platforms, satellite TV platforms. And I think they've got about 30 million people that watch their, their channel. So it's big. And the neat thing is when he gave me some information that I hadn't even heard of yet about people, insiders, people connected to Israel, people that are in defense connections, that have defense connections, well, they think something could possibly go down in Israel really, really bad. So, you know, he is prepared and he's definitely nervous. And he thinks that it's the 923 date, September 23rd, is correlating with a, you know, revelation prophecy in the Holy Bible. And he thinks that, you know, he, he firmly believes in Planet X, at least from what I gathered from him. And I'm interested to see what's going to happen because there's a lot of people that have put their name on the line and not just their name on the line, but put a lot of effort into saying they absolutely believe something's going to happen 923. And I'm still agnostic on that aspect, meaning I still don't know if there's something that's going to happen because, you know, I, even though I do feel something at any moment could be the spark of a really bad chain of events that could get catastrophic. You know, I've been warned about that stuff now for 30 years, over 30 years. I mean, when I was five, six years old, for some reason, my biggest fear literally was World War III <laughs> and getting kidnapped. Those were my two biggest fears for some reason. How bizarre is that? But, you know, we've been on the edge for so long. And it's just I guess we all need to think or somebody needs to think that the end of the world is going to happen at any given moment, because that what my, that's what might stop the end of the world from happening if you're if you believe in the the passages in the bible that say nobody knows the time well if we all think we know the time well maybe that'll keep pushing it out well when it comes to prophecy my the first rule of prophecy is always be aware of it but never live in expectation of it and expectations can be easily manipulated and a good case in point was blood moon triad theory all right that was a huge, huge thing there a few years back, and it wound up going nowhere down a rabbit hole. Well, there was a lot of embarrassment, a lot of people, whoa, like that. Now, there was a lot of manipulation, and it's what I call expectation stampedes. When people expect a certain thing to happen on a certain date, what will happen is disinformation operatives jump on that. If they see an expectation that's date driven, they create a stampede and they whip it up. They just whip it up with fear and hype and do whatever they can because what they're really wanting to do is exhaust people's attention in alternative ideas. They don't want people to think outside the box. If people are thinking inside the box, that's where the people who employ these disinformationalists want folks to be, because when folks are inside the box, they can be easily controlled and told what to think. So you have date-driven expectations that are used and manipulated. That being said, you know, I've always looked at the Bible as a wisdom text. I don't assign any greater value to it than other ancient wisdom texts when it comes to my research. But the Bible has a tremendous amount of Planet X knowledge embedded within it, not entirely obvious. For example, depending on which translation, there are so many translations of the Bible, it boggles my mind. But depending on which interpretations are used, you're going to see the term destroyer, or you're going to see some other term. Well, destroyer is exactly what the ancient Hebrews and ancient Egyptians named. It was the name they had for Planet X, Nibiru. Uh, the ancient Atlanteans called it Hercolobus. And there were other names that were given to it by other cultures around the world. You know, but it's uh, rose by any other name is still the same. Uh, I think that for me, what I'm really looking for on August 21 is to see if we have a watershed event. That being said, you know, there's, a, there's an old bit of wisdom. The failure to observe an object proves only one thing. You have failed to observe the object. 
again, do not bring expectations of a result or a date-driven event, but you want to be in awareness of things and to be looking to see what will happen. You know, during the uh, 1999 eclipse over Turkey, where NASA imaged the Nostradamus King of Terror comet, everybody you know, just didn't notice it. Nobody noticed it except me. Some oddball guy living in, you know, Scotts Valley, California at the time and just happened to study the video feed and see a camera operator jump up into the overskin to see what was coming in. And it was a fluke. So, you know, everyone has an expectation, gee, if they're going to see the comet, it's going to be big and bright and bold and, you know, everyone's going to be woo on. Ah, no. Yeah, you have to be aware and you have to be looking. I was fortunate. I caught it. Um, that launched my career with a f- article that uh, Millennium Group gave me 5 million hits. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, this August 21st coming up, are we going to have another King of Terror? What will happen? What will not happen? And the failure to observe something just proves you failed to observe. You know, it's as much a function of uh, where you, the camera is pointed as anything else. So, you know, for that reason, I just, um, you know, a king of terror was, it was outside the frame. It was just momentarily in the frame because of a curious uh, videographer. Same situation could happen here. Planet X could either just jump out at us on August 21 and be bold or, It could be a fluke that we see it because somebody just moved the camera off to the right or left during the eclipse. We'll see when we get there. As to September 23, we'll see when we get there. Uh, What I can say about November of this year is that this is when uh, Ed Dames has said we're going to see it, but also in 2008 whistleblower Robert Dean, Uh, and he was a command master sergeant, which is in the Army with your NCO ranks. That is the highest ranking sergeant is the sergeant of the Army. There's just one of those. Under the sergeant of the Army will be the second highest ranking non-commissioned officer uh, sergeant, which would be command master sergeant. That was him. He was way up there. And command master sergeants are the kind of guys that they don't make the decision, but they are the ones that get the security clearances. They see everything. They're the ones that are going to be sitting in the vaults with the keys to the kingdom. And so that's how he came across Planet X. And he was not the only one. There were other high-ranking sergeants that, you know, I have talked to over the years, same thing. And they saw the information and told me everything that happened about Planet X. So we have all this awareness and we're looking to see. I have seen people posting a lot of very credible observation videos. I think that the, uh, the best, for me, the best videos still were the ones that were released in, uh, by Nibiru Shock 2012 and DNR Shortly after that, these were from the South Pole Telescope. We broke the story on the South Pole Telescope in 2006. It's the perfect device in the perfect area to observe a dark object coming up from the southern skies. Brown dwarf stars are something that had to be close before you see them in visible light. But in infrared, they stand out. And uh, there were disclosure videos that came out of Uh, that South Pole Telescope facility that were just absolutely superb. And what made them very critical and believable to me was the immediate attacks and suppression that happened afterwards in both cases. And it was very, very fast, very vicious, uh, very vulgar. And they go in and, you know, 
the account for Nibiru Shock 2012. I did have a brief communication with that individual. I was a fine person. I was really impressed by you know, his response to me. And, but his account was compromised, taken over by imposters. And uh, then they you know, put up pornography videos and all kinds of things, anything they could to uh, make him look ridiculous and you know, put up uh, mystery messages that, ha, 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 you've been spoofed and this kind of nonsense. You know, but I know when a site has been taken over, it's not the only one. Um, there have been other sites, people do incredible work. They try and maintain some anonymity because, you know, I've just, I put my face on my work. I put my name on my work and uh, that's it. And I take the hits for it. And there are people that actually do want to, <laughs> they want to keep the rest of their lives intact. They don't want to trash their lives to go out and put their face on the work. So they go, try and go out anonymously, but that always backfires on them and uh, they get attacked and it's easier to attack them anyway, because if you have a YouTube channel, I mean, Rex, you're branded with your channel. If somebody stole your channel, you could go to YouTube. Yes, it's a difficult process, but you could get your channel returned to you. You could prove that you are that person. Uh, on the other hand, if you're doing something anonymously, how do you prove it? Worse yet, if you do that, then you have to come forward and identify yourself so that whoever hijacked your account is going to know exactly who you are. So this is how the suppression takes place. So there's that for me is very, very real. I see the suppression. I see lives being destroyed. You know, if this is nonsense, if Planet X is a bunch of bull, why is so much money, time, and effort being employed to humiliate and destroy the lives of honest and decent people? Tell me that. You know, it certainly seems like the Planet X slash Brown Dwarf Star, Binary Star, Nemesis, Nibiru, Wing Destroyer, Wormwood, there, that is the most controversial topic that I cover for some reason. I would think that it would be the fact that they put aborted baby cells and animal parts and cleaners, heavy duty cleaners in vaccines that they mandate for children and human beings. I would think that that would be a little bit more controversial. I would think that the fact that 76% approximately of the ozone has been depleted from the enormous amounts of chemicals that are being sprayed into the atmosphere combined with probably Fukushima and Chernobyl and the various 449 nuclear reactors around the world that are constantly or oftentimes leaking radioactive isotopes into the world that cause decaying of concrete surroundings, you know, like the Hanford nuclear site in Washington state that recently had a, uh, a hallway that was close to the extraction point of where the majority of the plutonium was extracted from uranium for our nuclear arsenal. Well, that location, one of the decommissioned tunnels to that facility collapsed and people are like, well, you know, how could that happen? You know, well, I would think that would be a lot more heavily fortified, but come to find out the concrete decays from the nuclear radiation, eating it away. And if you don't stay up on that and, you know, keep that thing, updated well that's the kind of stuff that's going to happen so there's so many different possibilities just the whole planet x thing is is the icing on the cake yet at the same time why is it the most controversial why are there more trolls out there it seems towards planet x than anything else like the nuclear reactors which if you really think about it marshall 449 nuclear reactors around the world i mean if they all went off at once would there be anything that could save people anyway unless you were underground so far underground and even then You'd have to have plenty of room to move around. It reminds me of the film that came out, Blast from the Past. Good movie. Came out in the, what, late 90s, early 2000s or something. That's when they used to even have VHS tapes. So it came out a while ago where this guy builds an underground facility underneath his house and because he's getting ready. You know, he thinks that World War II, or there's going to be nuclear weapons launched. And he sees something outside go down. So he thinks that there's nuclear weapons launched. So he takes his family underground. And they live under there for, I think, 30 years. 
or probably three or four years. Then they come out and no, nothing happened. And he was just so blown away though, because things had changed so much in 40 years. You know, it used to be the the good family values, people having a, a good meal with their, you know, with their family, with their kids, with their spouse. And and now when he comes back out from underground, he sees these people with earrings from their ear to their nose to their belly button, you know, it's just totally new to him. He's like he's in an alien world. So what in the world do we really do? I mean, there's so many places that we have to start. It's just good, I guess, to, to do something to at least prepare unless you just want to give up and say, ah, I give up, game over, I don't care anymore. Well, that was the whole point of my series and creating yeah. this Two Suns in the Sky. And look, what the elites want you to do is they want you to just say, oh, what the hell can I do about it? I'm just not going to do anything about it. Or that great one. I'll cross that bridge when we come to it. You know, that logic to me is self-defeating because when you finally come to it, you're going to be alive on one end of that bridge or dead on the other. And people have this uh, denial bravado. You were talking about earlier in the interview and they were going, well, if it happens, it happens. Yeah. So when you see a wall of water rushing at you, are you just going to sit there and say, no, nah, I'm not going to run for my life. Um, I remember saying, if it happens, it happens. So I'm just going to stand here like a dumb, stupid schmuck, and I'm going to die because I was a dumb, stupid schmuck. How many people do you think are going to do that? Or are they going to be running in the opposite direction, as futile as that is, screaming, feet don't fail me now? In other words, there are no atheists in a foxhole. So this bravado, denial bravado, it's pervasive. And what the elites really want is that they want for a maximum loss of life. That's the reason why there's all of this suppression that you see. They want 90% of the people to die. They don't see us as human beings. They see themselves as human beings. They see us as useless eaters. I mean, it's no different than, you know, we're the catfish at a catfish farm. And it's something where if they can cull the herd, then they have a much smaller population that they have to manage, makes it much easier. And expanding the population isn't difficult, you know, Give us some wine and uh, some Viagra. And we can work wonders. We're prolific. Bingo. You know, so they don't see us as sentient human beings. They see us as serfs, as slaves, uh, a slave species, an underclass that our entire function in life is to serve them and to provide for their sense of control and comfort. So they want us to die because there's frankly, during the planet X tribulation, there's not enough food to support as it is. There's not enough food to support seven, some odd billion people. All right. My gosh, it gets worse. Who knows? And the denial is strong. You know, there was, I watched this series on Netflix, polar seas, and it was about all these people that, could finally, because of climate change, sail through the Northwest Passage in their yachts, all right? And you had out there people paddling through it and folks in their little 31-foot sailboats and the like. And so everyone is just, you know, taking advantage of the fact that it, the change up there has profoundly noticeable. And one of the things that the series did very well is that the indigenous populations up there, they're having a terrible time. They understand what's happening. They're seeing grasses and in species that are coming in, invading, uh, because the climate is changing. They're seeing the, you know, the ice isn't there anymore, the glaciers, the snow. The ice is melting. There are scientists that are there. They're seeing this catastrophic consequence that's happening. 
But when they were talking to other people who are, you know, la, la, la in the, in the cruise ships or oil workers in Prudhoe Bay, they're all going, well, climate change is a big nonsense. Or, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And these are all people who are not directly impacted. The people who are directly impacted. They know. They're trying to say something, trying to get a message out, and it's falling on deaf ears. So, you know, this is just a sad situation. It's human nature. If you're not, you know, if you're not the one that is being affected, then it's not happening. You're not going to believe in sinkholes until your car is swallowed by one. And then only maybe if you were in the car and managed to get out of the sinkhole before the car disappeared. And maybe then you're going to go, well, yeah, I don't know. There's something to this sinkhole phenomenon that's happening. And yeah, you know, there's always been sinkholes in Florida, but we're talking about sinkholes happening everywhere, land tears. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are happening high amounts of seismicity, high amounts of volcanism. You know, with earthquakes, we see the manipulation. Uh, folks will turn to the Weather Channel for truth. Well, the Weather Channel is owned by elite PTB. All the media is controlled by just a handful of corporations. There's no one competing to get the message out. Everything's packaged. Everything is fed. And people are, you know, they want to stay inside the box. If they stay inside the box, then there's always going to be something on the shelf at Costco and they don't have to worry about it. And they start seeing shortages at Costco. Maybe they'll start going, well, what, what's happening? I am a taxpayer by God. Why don't I know? They're not going to say, why is it I am ignorant by choice? That's the last thing they're going to say, because, you know, people are inside the box are always going to look to put it on someone else. They're not going to re be responsible for their own self-imposed ignorance. And that's the truth of it. But there welcome. are those. Go ahead. I was just going to say, welcome to the new, new world order. <laughs> and it's amazing the way the mindsets of people have gone over the past 20, 30 years. And it sounds like the powers that be are calling you right now, Marshall. Uh, yeah. no, actually, it's an old friend, but <laughs> they don't call. They just whack Listen. your income. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I've got to say it's very interesting because this is the second day in a row this has happened doing these live shows. Somehow, I'm still able to do a live show with you here on um, this platform, but I have no internet connection. I've had no internet connection now for almost 20 minutes. I've been... Uh, attempting to um, change the screen and look at a different part of your website, YOWUSA, and it's not even letting me. So this happens sometimes during interviews. It's very bizarre. I don't know how it happens. But, you know, with that said, if we can, why don't we close out tonight? And if you would tell our audience how to, um, you know, YOWUSA.com, but if they would want to know more about, there's, they said they were doing a special for Leak Project if they wanted right. to get this new series. So uh, when I get, when I get two suns in the sky up, it'll be available. And uh, with an ebook edition uh, on my website exclusively, we'll have the print book. You can buy, you'll be able to buy that on Amazon, but from mine, you'll get a bonus. You'll get three audio CDs uh, for free with that. And also there'll be a version that will have the DVDs, the book and the CDs. And uh, I will be uh, giving you uh, a code for that so that that particular package, the DVD package, people will be able to get a 25% discount on that just to get that launched and out there. And so uh, when I have the site up and operational, I'll send you the code and then get the word out. Right on. Well, Marshall, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you're extremely busy. You've got a lot going on. You're working on multiple platforms and projects. So thank you for coming on Leak Project. 
And ladies and gentlemen, also check out leakproject.com. If you want to become a premium member at Leak Project for 10 bucks a month, we're doing a special right now, 50 bucks for the whole year. You'll get access to every single podcast, downloadable, streamable, ad-free. Your contributions greatly help Leak Project. And there is an exclusive members section available for premium members where I download exclusive podcasts. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being here with me. Question everything, ladies and gentlemen. Be safe and be the change you want to see.